We have the last talk of the day by Dr. Bruce Demer of the University of California, Santa Cruz, USA. Dr. Bruce Demer is an astrobiologist with the UC Santa Cruz Department of Biomolecular Engineering. He is a computer science background and has collaborated for over a decade with Professor David Demer on developing and testing a new hypothesis for how life began on the Earth. He also has 20 years of experience working with NASA and other space agencies on designs for new spacecrafts for the detection of life in the solar system and for extending human civilization beyond the Earth. Recently, he has become interested in how recent scientific evidence for the mechanism of life's origin might provide new understanding for its subsequent evolution and the arising of the human world and conscious experience. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen to bring up the slides. Everyone hear me all right? Yes. Wonderful. I think there were six people waiting to get in uh, on the chat, I noticed there. Probably let them in. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, K.S. Daya and Prem Saran Trimolai for inviting me to the meeting here. I met uh, Prem and Professor K.S. Daya at the Science of Consciousness Conference a couple of years ago. In, uh, in Tucson and with their daughter. And this has led to this uh, wonderful uh, invitation to present our, some of our work to you. So with that, uh, I'll get started. Uh, what I'm gonna to try to do is to present uh, the mechanism of what we're working with chemically in trying to sort of piece together the things that might have happened to, li to lift life from non-life, so from inanimate matter to animate matter on the early earth, derive a metaphysical explanation or a, an algorithmic abstraction from that, and then apply it to some notions and some guesswork about the meaning, maybe a more philosophical application. So let me get this going. So the presumptions are, that consciousness, that conscious self-awareness arose only after billions of years of evolution in and into a few complex social organisms such as humans. So this is a very reductionist materialist approach that I'm presenting to you today. Uh, and that as this experience arises, it begins to operate in tandem with a larger field, something like the synchronous field that Carl Jung described itself powered by uh, a collective probabilistic informational interchange. And this is guesswork, this is, this is a notion. Uh, the last presumption is that uh, in the highest order of things that uh, life consciousness and this field uh, each arise from a collaborative sharing system, a network of exchange. So let's start with mechanism. Uh, this is a quote from my colleague uh, just this past week. We're developing a connection between Whiteheadian philosophy and the origin model. Uh, and his quote was uh, quite telling, and I thought I'd just use it directly here. Uh, For life to begin somewhere in the universe, there needs to be, exist a probability engine making the thermodynamically unlikely more likely. And one of the gentlemen who made this uh, presumption a long time ago is Charles Darwin. When he wrote on the question of life's origins, you can see the quote here, the very famous quote about life could begin in some warm little pond somewhere. But the second part of the statement, I just wanna emphasize that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes it is a statement about forming polymers, which are proteins, and enabling them to grow more complex, uh, i.e. They, they move away from equilibrium. They don't break down 
and go back to the short polymer that might have existed before, they become longer polymers. And so it's quite a breathtaking insight for Charles Darwin in 1871. So where might you find such an engine that can change probabilistic events? Well, we believe that it could be some, somewhere like this, a, a vision of a hot spring pool in a Hadean volcanic island on the early earth. This would be about 4 billion years ago. And at the edge of this pool is where we think uh, the chemistry of life's origins can happen. So what are the parts of this engine, this, this uh, in a sense, thermodynamically uh, driven engine? Uh, well, the organics uh, for it, we believe, come from space and the atmosphere and other sources. Uh, organics like amino acids have been discovered on asteroids, uh, meteorites, and dust. Delivered by infall on the early Earth four billion years ago, much more high volumes of this material was coming in than even today. Uh, this material would then accumulate uh, in on the land, but it would be lost in the ocean. This is why uh, our science really has shifted now back to land as a place where the chemistry for life's beginning can start. And once you get accumulation in small pools, especially hydrothermally cycled pools, you can form things called protocells. And on the right here is a lipid, it's a solution of lipid in an acidic buffer uh, just being uh, hydrated. And you can see all of that beautiful behavior of uh, lipid bilayers under a microscope. Uh, this is the organizing matrix for life today. And we believe it's how life got started uh, 4 billion years ago or so. So what is the, how does the engine operate? Well, we think it operates through cycles of drying and wetting to form and encapsulate the polymers that life needs to get started. So for instance, on the bottom, you'll see the, the pool has <coughs> dried down and formed layers, <coughs> excuse me, formed layers of this lipid. Between the layers, the, the dehydrated layers, monomers of polymers such as peptides, uh, amino acids can form polymers through evaporation, through what are called uh, condensation reactions without enzymes, the, without the need for the complicated machinery that life has uh, through drying. And when you rehydrate the pool, you get a budding off of these uh, small vesicles, these lipid vesicles. Some of them will contain uh, polymers that were made through the drying phase. And as a result, some could be stabilized by the polymers they contain and carry these polymers back uh, for another round, then they can grow, they can become more complex. So the operation of this engine of creating protocells that contain random polymers is akin to a, uh, a roulette wheel. Uh, you're spinning trillions of natural chance experiments on this wheel, and you can therefore draw functional polymers out of the background of all of the random sequences. So we've done uh, about 10 years or 15 years of empirical demonstrations of this making of protocells, cycling them and watching the polymers grow in length, both in the laboratory and the field. And this is uh, me a couple of years ago at Rotorua, uh, New Zealand, a place called Hell's Gate, where we placed vials uh, directly in a heat block in the hot spring environment and cycled them with uh, basically the pipetter uh, hydrating and rehydrating uh, the solutions of lipid and the building blocks, uh, two of the building blocks of RNA, which is AMP and UMP. And this is actually a visual inspection of uh, the dried layer of lipids uh, in one of the vials. And in between these lipids would be the, the monomers of RNA moving slowly around, moving gradually and getting together into uh, long chain polymers. And this worked um, surprisingly, uh, our laboratory work, which you can see on the left, uh, this is called a gel. Uh, it showed the smudge that's shown on the tip of that arrow is showing about a 50 chain length uh, of this RNA, uh, this, this AMP plus UMP, what's called a poly A plus poly U uh, RNA polymer. 
uh, formed in the laboratory and in the hot spring, we were able to get much more product. We were able to get a multi hundred mer chain lengths of RNA uh, cycling just for one, I would say they're 35 minute cycles over four hours. So it works, you know, we, it's an away from equilibrium system just as Charles Darwin had requested. So the mechanics of the engine are very fascinating. So you have three phases. You can see this little wheel that turned a second ago. You have a dry phase where you form your polymers, a wet phase where you test them against stability, uh, whether they stabilize the compartment they are in. And then they form this gel aggregate we call a progenote, a term coined by Carl Woese about 50 years ago, where we think that interaction can start up the metabolic processes of life. And so along this way of this, basically a chemical evolutionary engine, this is before life, before Darwinian selection, uh, you can get the formation of, from the random background, polymers that do jobs. So one of the first is stabilization, uh, where we see more polymers coming back through the cycle because they've stabilized the compartment that they are in. And then we believe that pore formation will be next, will be selected in the system, followed by metabolic cycles, if you can cycle this system long enough with the right conditions, spontaneously, perhaps a metabolic catalytic uh, cycle could emerge, followed by a number of other uh, functional polymers that eventually lead you to the first dividing cell on, under its own active control. So this is a proposal in our article in Astrobiology Journal of April of this year. So let's put it all together. The hot spring origin of life hypothesis. We have synthesis in space and a lot of atmospheric synthesis of organic compounds, accumulation on the land. We have concentration, which you need to have the chemistry get started. We have cycling, which you need to have to promote molecular evolution toward uh, more lifelike protocells and aggregates called progenotes. Then we have distribution of progenote protocell material into different aqueous environments, subjecting them to different stresses. And we can get to early life somewhere in the landscape. Perhaps it's an early form of photo capture that gets you uh, independent of the chemotrophic lifestyle of the hot spring pool. Then you have adaptation perhaps to the salty seashore, the estuarine environment. Then you have the colonization of the entire landmass via the shore. Uh, and all of these are backed up by fo the fossil record. If you look on the left, you see the geyserite discovered by our colleagues at University of New South Wales, 3.5 billion year old hot spring geyserite with clear stromatolite signs of life. Then you have a lacustrine stromatolite of about 2.7 billion years old, and then you have marine stromatolites. So the, the rock record actually tells a story of uh, life on land 3.5 billion years ago in hot spring environments. So the scientific interest in this has grown quite dramatically in the last three years. We had a, a cover story for the public on Scientific American where they did this wonderful illustration of, of the scenario. Uh, last uh, April, we had a cover story on the Astrobiology Journal, and you, this is public. You can, you can pull this down online. And then just uh, three weeks ago, uh, Nature covered this work and this proposal along with that work of our colleagues uh, as a feature in uh, Nature in December. So metaphysics. Um, the question we have uh, here for this audience uh, is, to interpret this for a larger uh, phenomenon, for a larger context of, if you can discover a metaphysics, or i.e. an abstraction of this engine, which could be the basis for all emergent phenomena, including conscious experience, question mark. So if there's a mechanism that brings life from non-life, it may be a generalizable mechanism. So really it's characterizing the engine that could carry passive self-assembled protocells across 
an evolutionary chasm between physics and biology. And I'm gonna know that's a mouthful, but let's take it apart. Physics perhaps, uh, not really at the quantum level, but at the, at the large object level is kind of a pre-statable environment. You push down on one side of a plane and it will undulate in a certain way on another side. So the physical environment, uh, when you introduce small compartments such as vesicles, you introduce crowding, uh, a kind of a unique uh, environment in the universe. A liposome can crowd polymers within its boundaries. It can let the polymers in and the building blocks and then crowd them. If you connect two compartments, just as we've done in our, in our hot spring experiments, you get transmission between the compartments. You get kind of a network effect. If you have a lot of compartments connected, such as in this view, you have an emergent network effect within poly, uh, protocell aggregates. And we believe that there's three properties that are derived from systems of cycling these aggregates. One is a shaping of probability because you're crowding the polymers together into compartments so that it, reactions are more likely. Uh, the I component you can see there is interactive networking across the aggregate. And the question mark here is that, and this is, hasn't been done in the laboratory yet, uh, that in such a system of cycling protocell aggregates, memories can emerge. And by memory, in this case, we need a, a, a template, a protogene can emerge out of that system. So the prediction is, and this is fairly big in, in our field of origin of life, that only protocells in their aggregate and in a sharing system, almost like an economy, can undergo uh, evolution and adaptation toward life it's not gonna be individuals in competition at this scale because protocells are mostly passive. So it's the network distribution of them that is the unit of evolution. So if we abstract the engine, we have a probability shaping component, we have an interactive networking component, and we have a memory system writing and reading, writing and reading. And that this is the system that, <clears throat> that brings life uh, uh, into, into being out of the background of geochemistry. <clears throat> so in general, in the universe, how do complex things emerge from simpler ones? Well, here's a simple, simple conception through cycling. So for example, the physics of the cosmos uses a kind of state changing uh, cycling. Atoms, you know, atoms are within stars. They form heavier elements. Those heavier elements then are distributed into different stars, but there is no template to tell you how to build stars. Everything is compositional memory. There's no, everything is really state changes. These are from some of our colleagues on campus who sort of brought this to our attention. So it's really a two phase cycling system that can build stars and planets. When you get life, you had a third phase with linear memory, genes in other words, which can code for traits and allow you to staircase up complexity much faster than a, a state changing system. A fourth phase emerges when neurons come into the picture, which support learning of the organism, adaptation within the lifetime of an organism, organism beyond just its genetic material uh, being mutated. And with sufficiently de dense network of neurons comes a fifth phase, which is cognition eventually supporting conscious self-awareness in some mammals. So just get enough neurons packed together. So this is a very reductionist, uh, materialist approach. Uh, so what we're proposing though, is that this PIM, this PIM, probability interaction memory model or formalism operates at all scales within this system, uh, starting with biology. So, what is the meaning of all this? Now we're gonna jump off into conjecture or as we at NASA call notional concepts. Uh, and the following, I'm gonna make the following proposition, that even if all of life can be reduced to the operation of cycling chemical engines, which is you know, an argument we're making here, that the emergent metaphysical output of vast numbers of these engines operating in concert might be sufficient to provide a substrate for conscious experience. And this is outside of my, my training, but I'm proposing this to you to 
see if this is something you would, would like to take on. And that these PIM cycles that are constantly generating uh, stacking evolutionary and memory and informational content uh, can power something when they're in concert, this kind of conscious field that has been described for so many generations. So the prediction that there's some kind of a field that it might provide a new view into synchronous events, extraordinary states of consciousness, and probabilistic and a, and a probabilistic operating system we can ping uh, to shape outcomes, and that's very very notional. But let's let's take a look at this. Here's a, a singular view of life's origins as a spire of complexity rising up, and that spire we're kind of on the top of that is a four billion year tall event of continuous away from equilibrium systems from far from the cosmic background. That system has been driven by primarily the, the inputs of energy. And as we started with wet dry cycling, that was a solar, you know, the sun's energy input to lift those polymers into complexity. And it really is driven by the thing on the right, the rotation of the earth to face the sun on a daily basis is the stacking mechanism to drive this complexity. That's the primary driver. The origin of life uh, could have resulted from this proposed PIM protocellular cycling system in a hot spring setting. The PIM engines uh, would bring ever more probable, improbable outcomes into being, including complex life forms, by the simple accumulation of memories, which are genetic material, all the dense interactions, uh, make more complex things uh, likely, such as eukaryotic cells, for example. And that as eukaryotic cells rise and you get a, a more densely interconnected life forms or things like fungi, you get an even more powerful probabilistic shaping, i.e. the entire bolus of life creates ecosystem niches which control its future state, giving rise to uh, metaphenomena. You know, outside in the redwood forest here, we have vast mycorrhizal mats that change the shape of the redwood forest. Uh, so this is the phenomenon I'm calling, you know, for lack of a better term, the field. <clears throat> so in this milieu of complex bodies, larger brains, uh, animals with these larger brains, and possibly all the social, really all social animals experience self-awareness. And human collective consciousness arising in tandem with this field in the natural world, but also our technological world, all of this the PIM activity, like the cell phone is a PIM device. This meeting that we're having now is a PIM event because we're crowded together into a Zoom call, we're interacting and we're recording the call. So we're doing this probabilistic interconnected memory shaping uh, called cultural awareness. So perhaps the, the mystics and others that have experienced these unity, uh, unity awareness experiences uh, are basically, and this is what's described in Tibetan Buddhism is what is described by uh, practitioners in the plant medicine path, meditators, uh, that you can achieve an awareness which becomes aware of itself. And perhaps if it understands its deepest origins and evolution, it's a unity awareness. So the, at the top of our spire is the realization of the complete system. Uh, beyond just self-awareness, the, the, the awareness of all, at least that we can contain as human beings. So this has all resulted from a 13.7 .7 billion year journey from cosmogenesis, the Big Bang through planets, origin of life, microbial epoch, animals and plants, nervous systems arising, self-awareness, and perhaps this concept of unity awareness, this remarkable uh, stacking of complexity over this long, long period of time. And here's a, the final 
slide in my talk, which is I call it a notional prediction. And if we can wrap our heads around this, consider that even a microbe or a group of micro microbial life, even the progenome, even simple passive protocells are shaping their the probability of future outcomes through crowding, through information sharing, and through memory reading and writing. They're changing the likelihood of things happening in their favor. This is what life does in a sense. It, it shapes future probability. So if, if simple organisms do this, that perhaps much more complex human beings can interface with a much more complex probabilistic operating system or field that shapes our future outcomes. And so uh, I propose to you that, uh, you know, all throughout my life, if I've had a strong imaginative intention, like I'm gonna work on the origin of life. I had this vision when I was 14 years old, I'm gonna work on the origin of life. And I had that intention. I didn't know what that meant, but I kept focused on that with attention. So I would, pay attention anytime something came up to do with the origin of life, like computing or complexity theory or meeting a certain person. And I would, I would keep going on that. And every time an action came, I would, I would basically take the action. So what happened to me is what from the presence of when I was 14, all these little marbles of action that had rolled my way that I had taken allowed me to actualize the position that we're in now where we have proposed a testable hypothesis for the origin of life. And this took over 40 years in my case, but I kept at it. And I think that most of you out there realize that that's really a way to bring remarkable outcomes into being. I mean, the formation of the school, for example, you know, it, it's, it's these kinds of things. And so perhaps, it is shaping a kind of probabilistic field around us to bring these, uh, these actions into, into being. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank uh, K.S. Diane and, and her husband, Prem, and their brother, Madhan, who's at the University of Houston for helping make this happen. These are some of our collaborators on this work. Uh, I'm starting to work with philosophers. I'm starting to work with uh, some spiritual teachers that are interested in linking this very mechanistic tying of uh, life's origins to bigger concepts. Uh, and I welcome anyone here to uh, reach out uh, at my email address below if you'd like to, to participate. And I think that uh, with that, this leaves us enough time for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Damer. It was a very nice, lucid talk as you have always given. So there is a question that during the process of the abstraction of the engine, how are the probability shaper, memory system, and interaction network interlinked with each other? That's a very good question. Uh, what happens in, in protocells is you get, uh, you get a cell size compartments about 10 microns across in these li liposomes and stuff bounces around. So, things are more likely to click together uh, very non-linearly. I mean, it's compared to the molecules out in solution, these reactions just happen and they happen much more rapidly. Even if the, the polymers are attached to the membrane and they're moving around, they're even more concentrated. So that's probability shaping at the chemical level. The interaction happens when we have a mass of protocells where a product in one that's being made by some kind of a cycle can basically diffuse into another. And that's open for study. That's just a new area that, that hasn't been investigated. The memory part of it, we can create these genetic templates, unwind them with hot water, and then form new products through base pairing. So this is the low level chemical thing that we're doing. We haven't seen the spontaneous arise arising of the M component of templates. Now, so that's PIM at the bottom. The PIM here, you know, is, I just saw Philip Goff come in, uh, come back in. Hi, Philip, I just love- Sorry, love I couldn't seem to get on and I had to restart my computer. So apologies for being late. No worries. So PIM worked here because 
I got to know Philip's work because of this conference. So this conference combined, collapsed me and Philip into a smaller space. So I went out and read some of his work in the hopes that I could interact with him, the I component, and that together we might use, we might build a new map, some new templates of, of what is, you know, uh, perhaps this is a, an underpinning for panpsychism that might be co uh, in concert with some, some of his proposals or Whiteheadian ideas or whatever. So PIM has operated here in this conference very effectively uh, because we're like a protocell, right, in this, in this container. So that's a longer answer to a short question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I have to say in Barnes, I'm a humanities person. <laughs> so um, I think I got, I mean, I found this very um, interesting and also very, you know, as far as I could understand everything, very plausible. Um, the question I have is the function of time in your model. You know, I mean, coming from the humanities, uh, of course, time is one of the big problems in any kind of model you devise. And in your model, it all seems so neatly, you know, and then, and then, and then, and then, and this happens, and then this. But of course, we also know that this is a model and, uh, you know, chronology as well as causality are structures. Um, and um, hearing this, and then, and then, and then, I was wondering, but for these, let's just call it different phenomena or parts to anything to happen, there has to be something like a potential for what I would just in the most general sense call communication for interaction. That, so, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you deal with this sort of different perspective on what you developed as a development, as a chronology, as a history? So that's, that's fascinating and that's, a point where we could collaborate because uh, I, I don't often deal in, in terms like this, but interpreting it chemically, what we notice in the hot spring environment, if we cycle our solutions every 30 minutes and we're in the dry phase, phase it permits preservation. It's like when you mummify a body in, in a tomb in Egypt, it preserves the body for thousands of years if you remove water. So water is a is a, is a, a, a in a sense a gas pedal for time because in time in the, the case of a complexifying chemical system is you're in a race against forming longer chain things versus their degradation and the biggest force that's going to break those bonds is water water is a universal solvent so if we left our protocells in solution for days we'd have lose all of our products there's a box in which this thing works that's why we think hot springs are ideal because hot springs are like natural clocks. They're, they're literally every 53 minutes or every 10 minutes filling a pool and it allows it to dry down, it gets concentrated, dries down, filling that pool. It's that repeating pattern that we think can ratchet up the chemical system toward life. So that's in a sense, and, and to some degree that's driven by the rotation of the earth, but it's also driven by inflow of, of water into the subterranean environment that drives hot spring chambers, which have reached boiling points at certain things. And you get this unbelievably repeating patterns. The only place you get it, apart from the rotation of planetary bodies, is in the hot spring environment. Tides are part of an effect of this too. So that's a sort of a time that's in, in the sense that the chemistry ended up working well within one of these boxes and so could have be highly productive. If it got into a box that didn't work well, it expires, it stops. So that's perhaps one could draw a metaphor into life that we have to eat on a regular basis, we have to sleep on a regular basis, we have to eliminate waste on a regular basis on a very periodic basis to maintain organismal health. And so perhaps that is the carry-on effect of being in ideally timed period periodicity for a civilization to work, you know, for cities to be powered by generator plants, for we have to be on the clock in a sense uh, from our biology to through our technology, through our culture. And that this original patterning came from the ideal Goldilocks zone of chemistry on 
planets to be able to click life into being out of non-life. So that that's a that's a mechanistic approach. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Bruce.